We are live. Ah, hi. So exciting. Kiki combos. Okay. Yes. You're going to let some people come into the room today, this evening. Naguanda gave a shout out. So we'll see if Naguanda shows up. I know. I saw that. I didn't know you guys uh, knew each oh, other. We were, we were in Des Moines together. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hi, Dave. My, my one of my regulars. How are you? Now, Dave, are you a teacher? Hi, Jim. So good to see you. Another Convos crew. I always see Jim commenting all the time. Hi, Jim. Yes. He's always there. Jim's like one one of the top the top uh, members of the Convos crew, I'll tell you that. Jim and Dave. Yes. Good to see you all. Good evening. Good evening. And welcome to our Thursday. Kiki, honey. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know, I, um, hi. Oh, look who it is. Is that Kelly? Kelly. <laughs> Kelly. Kelly. Yes. Hi, Martin. So good to see you. My Scottish friend. All the way from Scotland. Yes, Jim, again. We love you, Callie Day. Love you, Callie. I miss you. Yes, I teach non-music major voice lessons at MSU as part of my scholarship. Wonderful. Wonderful, Dave. I didn't know that. Yes. Good, e good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Everybody, so happy to see you all. Healthy, I hope. Happy, I, I pray. Mm -hmm. Yes. And last week was wonderful. We had Miss Angela Brown last week, who was fantastic. She was so inspiring. And you know Angela as usual. I love Angela. Yeah, she was the grand dame. So she was amazing. It was so nice to see her. I hadn't seen her in so long. Um, you know, just on social media. But uh, I saw her singing the Verdi Requiem here in Asheville. Ah, yes. Yeah. I'm sure it was. That's how we are, honey. Fabulous. Stunning. Yes. Hi. How are you, friend? Greg, good to see you. Hi, Zach. Zach Gordon, who's the artistic. Are you artistic director? Right, Zach? Of, uh, how would I forget? The, Festival Opera. Festival Opera in, Cal out in, in California, in the Bay Area. It just, uh, I think you're artistic director. Yes, and a baritone. I did a traviata with him several uh, years ago. I think it was my second turn in that in that opera, but uh, yeah. So anyway, anyway, welcome everybody. So wonderful to see you, General Director. Okay, get it, okay. get it, get it right. General Director. General Director of Festival <laughs> Opera and a fantastic baritone. Wonderful. Yes. Hello, Ruth. How are you today? So good to see everybody. Well, I want to introduce my amazing friend and my amazing colleague, Dr. Bradley Willard. I'm going to do a little introduction. Is, is that okay, Brad? That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Dr. Bradley Willard holds a doctorate from the University of Kentucky, as well as degrees from Manhattan School of Music and UNC School of the Arts. He has served on the administration of both Manhattan School of Music and the Juilliard School and has served as breathing specialist and lecturer for UNC School of the Arts, NYU Tisch School of the Arts, UNC Chapel Hill, North Kentucky University, Haverford University, Gardner-Webb University, and what's this, Wachita? Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, Baptist University. In Arkansas. Ah, okay. And he has also served on the voice faculty of Mars Hill University. He has conducted workshops for NPR and has a private healing practice in Asheville, North Carolina, working with singers, public speakers, authors, entrepreneurs, leaders, coaches, and unheard voices. Dr. Willard's breathwork students have performed on the stages of the Lyric Opera of Chicago, Washington National, San Francisco, Santa Fe, San Diego, Wolf Trap, Glimmerglass, Carnegie Hall, Lyric Kansas City, Portland Opera, woo, 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 
uh, Chautauqua Opera, Des Moines, Palm Beach, and many, many, many more. Uh, his students have been finalists and semi-finalists at the Houston Grand Opera Studio, which I think this week and tomorrow is their concert of arias, which is the finals for their uh, Young Artist Program. So make sure you guys tune in tomorrow um, evening for their finals. There's some amazing young talent in that. So tune in. Um, they uh, And they have advanced onto prestigious vocal programs, such as the Manhattan School of Music, Cincinnati Conservatory, Indiana University, listen, everywhere, right? University of Michigan, Peabody Conservatory, and also uh, Miss Horns, the song continues. I am so honored to have my friend Brad on my show. Um, and I, Brad actually also is a soloist at, on the on the American Spiritual Ensemble, one of the ensemble members, and that's where we met for the first time many years ago. Now, hasn't it been? Oh, yeah, I think it's been a few years. Just yeah, <laughs> yeah. Which you know, Dr. Corby knows how to find all the talent. Anyway, mm -hmm. it is my honor and my pleasure to have my friend, Dr. Brad, on the show to inspire us, to enlighten us, to pour into us his work and some of the things that he's been doing. But first he's going to talk about his career and uh, how he got into this. But we are going to cheers today. And what are we cheers into? Uh, opening the heart and having conversations from there. All right, cheers. Ding, 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 ding. Yes, yes. Mm. Yes, and I'm drinking a Beaujolais. And what are you drinking? I have a little um, mango spritzer. Okay, come on, Spritzer. Spritzer. That's yeah. right, you got a doctorate, so you got to be feeling <laughs> in there. Okay. <laughs> Only the best, honey. Only the best. <laughs> Trader so, Joe's, okay? Yes, yes. So I've been wanting to have Brad on the show for a, a while, and he reached out uh, via Instagram and tagged some fabulous people. And I have been trying to figure out, this was what, around New Year's, right? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I've been trying to figure out when I can get Brad in. And I actually was not going to do a show today because I was just recording with Urban Arias for a project that's coming up in the spring, a three day recording down in DC. And I was exhausted and I'm a little bit behind on other projects and I'm trying to get myself. But the spirit literally at five minutes to midnight uh, said, Ted said to uh, message Brad and ask him what he want. Does he want to come on the show tomorrow? And um, I woke up. I think I woke up to your message saying, absolutely, we're going to do it. And so as with every guest on this show, and I don't mince the words, it really is uh, uh, um, the universe, the spirit, the energy that tells me this person this week and this person this week. And so I just let the spirit lead me. And so I'm going to let you have the floor, Dr. Bradley. Well, thank you so much. I am so, I'm so honored to be here. And the work you are doing, thank you for the work you're doing. So, um, yeah, when I got your text this morning, like I, I had told you before we started, I have been in, really inward for the past month and, month, month and a half and not done hardly any postings and just really waiting to hear that it was time to move outward. And I got your text and I was like, it's time, let's go. So, so I'm really excited to, to be here tonight and to talk a little bit about healing around the voice, around body image, you know, all of these things that, um, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll get there whenever we get there. But mm -hmm. so um, I'm sorry, so, one second. Yeah, go ahead. Hang on a little bit. It's too loud. Sorry. It was too loud. My, my sposo in the back there. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead, baby. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, my career, um, I started, I did my master's in Manhattan School of Music. And from there went into the Young Artist route, singing at Des Moines, Kentucky Opera, Sarasota Opera, Chautauqua Opera, all of that. Yeah. Direction. And then someone, um, I was at Des Moines and um some uh, faculty member from LSU said, oh, you should come to LSU and, and just start your doctorate. And I was like, I don't want a doctorate. I'm a singer. How am I going to get a doctorate? <laughs> like, I mean, I'm not an academic. I never, I, I trained at conservatory. I trained at University of North Carolina School of the Arts for my undergrad. So like academics was not something that I did naturally. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I started at LSU and was there for about a year and a half. And my teacher there left, Paul Marrero. 
And so then I moved um, to start my doctorate at University of Kentucky mm -hmm. and began studying there with Dr. McCorvey and um, who was fabulous. Yes, we love Doc, we love Doc. And, and was there and finished the um, qualifying exams, which were really hard, you know, um, anybody that's been down that road, it's, it's a tough road, you know? Yeah. And um, being in a doctoral program really was like grinding any type of ego that I had from a, being a singer was, was ground down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's what they say. That doctor will humble you. Right. And, and you know what? I needed it. I, I really, I needed it because it brought me to the work that, that we'll talk about because I had, I had really been in that conservatory route um, in the YAP program, mm -hmm. really trying to maintain my naturalness as a, as a person, as a human being. And I felt the business and everything just taking that naturalness mm -hmm. and that humanness away. And I, I found myself singing for what was on the other side of the table rather than singing from this place that I fell in love with singing. Mm -hmm. And I thought at the end of the, after passing the qualifying exams, well, I don't know what I'm gonna write my dissertation on. So I'll just go to Germany, I'll go to Berlin. And I had a partner at the time who was finishing his dentistry degree. And so I said, I'm gonna go to Berlin for three months, try to look for management and see what happens. And so I was trying to really find that love for singing that I, that I felt when I was, you know, like six, mm -hmm. that, that little boy. Um, and so that was really why I went to Berlin. And I didn't know what, I, I, I didn't even know if I would finish the doctor. I was like, well, I passed the quads. I don't know what I'm gonna write my dissertation on, who knows. So I get to Berlin and I start working with John Norris. Who, do you know John? I do. I worked with him when I was in Maryland or even the Adler Fellowship at San Francisco Opera. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I know John. He's brilliant. He's a brilliant director. As yeah. Well. Mm -hmm. well, so he was doing breath coaching in, in Berlin and really trying to get people in their bodies. And I, and I heard about him. And so I said, well, I want to go have a session. Mm -hmm. And I remember that session of finally feeling the breath in the pelvic floor laying on the, like a spinal column, just sort of laying and finally feeling that. And I swear something, like something just sort of woke up inside of me. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, I, I have never been connected down here. Out of all of my training, out of all of my coaches, mm -hmm. I've never been connected down there. So it started bringing a lot of shit up. Mm. You know, yeah. growing up as a gay boy in the South is not an easy thing. You know, any anybody that's grown up feeling different, mm -hmm. there is these places that are waiting to be expanded. Yes. So I felt that open and all of a sudden I went back to my apartment and just started writing about childhood. childhood. Mm. And said, I, I think I have to do my research on the breath. I don't think we really know what the meaning of the breath is. I think we use it as a tool, but I think we have forgotten the source. Mm -hmm. Where is the breath coming from? Who am I? All of these, I call it my vocal awakening. It was like I was having like this inner experience mm -hmm. and the outer world no, no longer mattered. I actually stopped singing. And John Norris told me, he said, go start training at the Mittendorf Institute. And Ilse Mittendorf is like the mother of somatic work. And what is somatic? What is somatic is, is, is using every bit of your senses, every sense to feel, to experience one's body, one's breath, one's being, but really going and feeling it from the inside out rather than, for me, it's feeling it from the inside out. Mm -hmm. And no one had ever talked to me about this type of looking at the body and the breath. So I went back to Kentucky um, 
and I left my partner four years, which was really hard. I sold everything I had. I even had to leave my dog. It was very, it was, it was one of those moments where every attachment I had was having to go away. I mean, you can feel as I talk about it. I mean, it's really here. Yeah. And um, but it was a life or death choice for me because I could no longer live in the outer world, this materialistic world that was being that that I experienced as a singer. And I wanted to know what was this thing that was deeper. So I started training at the Middendorf Institute, which was all in German, mm -hmm. sitting on a stool for eight hours a day, just moving, slight micro movements. What does that feel like? So going really into the system, into the, not trying to say, oh, well, we're going to use it for this and get something out of it. That we're, you're not going to gain anything from doing that work. You're, you might lose something that's that's in the way of what you would like. Right. Exactly. You know, and I all and I, you don't like what you, I, all these light bulbs are going off for me. That's why I'm look struggling with the for the words. You know, I when I think about breath, it's always in preparation of a phrase. It's never yeah. thinking in out like it's never it's never deeper unless the character you know you know what i mean like it's yeah. never in that place and then to talk about all of the things that you had to release yes and and as an artist you know the all of the things that you need in order to support your career your partner your your things that you accumulate you know all of the the things that you need to support your pursuing this career you just you had to let them go and it's all these light bulbs going on but i don't want to i want you to keep talking i don't want to no go ahead i mean anytime you want to just insert let's just go yeah but, i mean i think i had to let go of that like antiques that i had carried from louisiana to kentucky like things i had had in new york like all of these things i just sold and um the only thing that i was left with was the language of German, which was new, um, in, in speaking it every day, mm -hmm. and, and the breath and the body. It's like, for me, it's like God gave me a reset button. Mm. Like, boom. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's interesting because as in this time, many people are either realizing that this is what they need to do, the reset button, you know, or, you know, if they call it pivoting or, you know, shifting to, you know, different careers. I, I said very early in the pandemic, I was like, not everybody's going to come back to this, this art form, this industry for uh, whatever personal reasons that they have. And um, yeah, you put it so beautifully into words. You know, all of any idea that I think I know where my path is going or that I control it has been obliterated. I have no idea until tomorrow if I'm going to go right or left, like you, like your text. All of a sudden, we're sitting here tonight. Mm -hmm. So coming to the breath was surrendering to that being the lifestyle, the way of life, mm -hmm. uh, the way of my heart. Um, that I have no idea where my path is going to lead, you know. And so I'm just sitting there learning about the breath and just having fun and not worrying about trying to create a sound and someone not telling me how to do my breath or how my body should feel instead someone's reflecting back to me to how do i feel and that's i feel like that's that's where the, our teachers are the ones that give you a reflection of yourself not the ones that tell you how to do it but the ones that always point you back to you. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, oh, that felt good. That didn't feel good. So I was in this experience, not singing. We just working with vowels, just inhaling on vowels, no sound. Inhaling on an ah. Exhaling on an ah. Mm. What is going on? Whoopi, we're not talking to you. Oh. Whoopi, wanted, Whoopi wanted to say something. I know the the six six. See how the spirit something just was like see? boom. Get go away. Not right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
it's yeah, so right. it, was in the, it was in the space and it tried, you know. Yeah, try to get in. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <Don't get now. laughs> but yeah, just sitting with vowels, just inhaling on vowels, inhaling on an E, mm -hmm. exhaling on an E, inhaling on an O, exhaling on an O. How does that vowel feel to the body? Mm -hmm. What opens up in the vowel? What opens up in the body that has nothing to do with sound? Each vowel has a space that opens the body. Yeah. Mm. But, but we don't think about that. We just all of a sudden put sound to it. And so one of um, my mentor, um, who studied with Ilsa Mittendorf for a long time, um, she was like a daughter to her, is, is my mentor. And she said, you know, Ilsa worked with those vowels for 10 years without putting sound. Mm. This is the type of dedication to the practice of working with a vowel for 10 years because they had not told her that they were ready to sound yet. And so that's, that's how I really take the breath in the body. It is such a sacred being. It really, for me, is a sacred being at this point. Yeah. Um, how did you trans, trans, uh, uh, how did you go from your career, your singing career, into the work, into teaching. What was that? What was the link in the in the? What was the chain in those in the link? There was another method that had to come in to that I had to pull from, and that was um, Carl Stahl's breathing coordination, because it started to talk about the function and structure of the breath. That there's a hundred possibilities of movement in the thoracic cavity. That there's always movement. So I ended up going from the Mittendorf Institute to learning this other method, which was a, a more, um, for me, a more masculine approach. So we had one approach that was rather feminine, very much in the experience and the gentleness and the nurturing and one that was much more. So we're going to look at anatomy now. And so that helped me and my, my mentor, um, Lynn, uh, Lynn Martin from New York, uh, is a very dear friend of mine, but she, I had came back for my grandmother. My grandmother, um, I heard in Berlin, you need to go home. And I came back and it was my grandmother's birthday. And the next day she found out she was going to, she had cancer, mm -hmm. esophageal cancer. And in three weeks she was gone. Mm -hmm. So I worked with her breath during that whole period. And I was like, I don't know how to write a dissertation on this ex experiential prayer. And, and then I contacted David Jones, who's my teacher in New York. And um, David said, go talk to Lynn. That might, that might help you. And it was exactly, it sent me right back into the breath. So now I was um, meeting her in New York, talking about this um, more of a function and structure. And I did that for about a year, collected all of that information and really learned the principles of breathing coordination by Carl Stahl. And then I went back, um, I was in Berlin and I heard, moved to Asheville, North Carolina. So again, part of being with the breath is listening for me, is listening to these inner callings. And so I said, Asheville, North Carolina, I said, it'd be a great place for you to do your healing work and for you to write your dissertation. So I moved to Asheville, North Carolina and I start preparing the proposal. And I don't know, do you remember Dr. Stemple? You know Dr. Stemple? Mm -mm. Voice rehabilitation doctor. And so I took the proposal up to Kentucky and he was very, I really felt like God came through him. He said, would you like to write your dissertation on other people's methods or would you like to write your dissertation on the one you've created? And it was like, oh, someone's giving me a choice to be the artist again. Mm. And in that the quote from Catherine of Siena came to me right in front of him, be who God meant you to be and you will set the world on fire. And I knew that was I knew that was my path. And so that was a hard road because I had to do qualitative and quantitative scientific research. To study my to study my method, I had to write out the method of what was my approach. How are both of these methods flowing into 
to this um, this one process. And I had to go in front of the Institutional Review Board to get approved. And they, they laughed. And I was like, I, I mean, <laughs> all of these researchers and, and I'm sitting in front of them. And I just, I quietly, I quietly went into the breath and I just gathered myself and I said, our area will never move forward if we don't do research. I said, I'm here to ask for guidance and to ask for help for you all to guide me how to do research. But we will never move forward to where your areas are if you don't lend a hand. Mm. You would have thought, I mean, the whole room all of a sudden started talking. You need to do this, this, this. And I think two weeks later, it was approved. Wow. So, wow. so it was... Um, it was, that was tough. I did my um, my research at University of North Carolina School of the Arts. On um, started with thirty one in participants, ended up with twenty nine participants and three faculty members. And but it was for me, this work is so much more than research because it's it's about my journey as as a being. Um, while I was in Asheville, I started working with healers uh, from Peru, from um, and and have continued working with healers. Um, from Mexico and India, and uh, my dear Native American elders who who guide me, like so those healing traditions flow into how I'm looking at a breath and body on the table. But what's more about the singer's story is I had to really mourn the death of the singer, and I don't know if singers really talk about that. No, people don't talk about it. Mm -mm. I had to. It was a deep grief of mourning of the dream that I had and that for me I felt God was taking me on a different path um you know and on that I had you know when I finished the doctorate I then went to teach voice faculty and and then I had to mourn that because I couldn't do what I I couldn't be in that role either well not with this kind of work in academia no, no. so mm -hmm. and so this was this was being left sort of as to the side and I said this is what my path came out of I can't do that and that was another death and having to mourn okay I got this degree in voice but now it's taking me in a different direction so there's it's for me it is about losing something it's about losing identity concepts and structures how, yeah how would you suggest that others do that because I, 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 you know, again with this pandemic, so much loss. Uh, we talked about this before the before we went live about people uh, and their work and their livelihood and the their identity, our identity, you know. And and I, um, I really there's been something in my spirit, you know, with this with this platform saying you have to address that you have to help people through and myself in a way for, for for a multitude of reasons you know through this process it's not just artists coming and talking about all the places that they sing and all the things that they've done and you know whatever yada yada but like it is really about give telling the story and giving tools like what you know what through your work has helped you get through these these losses because that's a great loss you know people don't understand you give your life to do this thing yeah everything every part of who you are from the moment you decide to do it and you you pursue it hard you go to school you spend all this money and it really is becomes who you are your identity in a way and so please please talk about like that part like how you were able to get to the other side of that you know, it's it's a hard it's a hard journey to get to the other side. But I don't think I could have done it without really good mirrors. Like my husband is one of the best mirrors that I have. You know, it makes me just to even feel that. And my elders, I couldn't find my mirrors in the sing in the singing community. I had to really go. To, that's why the breath workers. They could show me the mirror, mm. and I could feel, I could sit with my my native elders and feel the mirror, not the mirror of the material world, but the mirror of you are a beautiful soul. 
it, it this goes be, beyond race and gender and sexuality. Mm-hmm. Anybody that has carried that that trauma, it's going beyond that. It is being in this place of finding the mirrors where where someone sees beyond that. And but that's where our industry needs to go. Yes. That's where our industry needs to go is beyond that. So how do we do that? And it is looking at every belief and concept about yourself and saying, does that bring me into love? Does that bring me into love? Does that bring me into my body? Does it expand? Do I feel expansion when I breathe in that belief? And so it's listening to this inner world and hearing sometimes really ugly things. I did not like who I was. I mean, I came back from Berlin and I was living with my dad for three, four months before I could move up to Asheville. And I had to sit in the mirror of my family too. Mm. And that's, those are other mirrors. Yeah. You know, so it is It is really all of a sudden making the choice to turn this way and look at oneself versus always looking out. And I don't know if there's any other way. Mm. Mm. It's the hardest thing, you know. It's interesting that you said that you say that. that that's beautiful and enlightening. And um, I got up yesterday morning and I was doing my thing, you know, went to the bathroom, doing my thing. And I realized I hadn't looked at myself in the mirror for an hour. I had been up, not just for just, I mean, looked at myself in the mirror because there were some things I was carrying Mm -hmm. and I didn't want to look at myself. And I didn't think about it. I was like, you haven't even looked at yourself, you know, even with me washing my face and brushing my teeth, you haven't looked at yourself. See. And I said, and I had, you know, I was like, and I looked at myself and it was nothing wrong with me, but it was, so, it was, it was other, it was other stuff. Mm-hmm. So for you to say that, and it doesn't have to be a literal mirror, of course, but that, but, but when you came, but when you said that, it, that cropped into my head, like. Um, and that, that's the work, you know, it's, it's not, it's daily work. It's not like, <laughs> I, I do like the simplicity that's in here now. I've, I've done a lot of housekeeping. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's still daily work. Even when I got your invitation, this is me being vulnerable. Mm. Like all of a sudden, I was like, oh, I don't feel well. Something like I said yes, and then all of a sudden I'm my, my body, I'm like, what am I getting sick? You would have thought I had a gig getting ready to come up to go sing the dirty requiem. <laughs> oh, what's going on? And and I just watched the mind. And but I started to listen to it. And I started to have the conversation with it. But then I started to track it back further. And I said, oh, where's that belief coming from? That if you actually move outward, that something might happen. Mm -hmm. You know, I started to listen to that even deeper. And I was like, oh, this goes back to me being born two months premature with a right lung collapse. Mm -hmm. Me working with what I work with now, but two months premature, right lung collapse, lived in an incubator for two months. So I had to track that belief that came up today all the way back to that moment. Mm. You're safe. You're safe. You're safe to be visible in this way. Mm. But the two or three hours of digging and looking at that, looking at the voice, looking at the belief, looking at the the suffering. And then all of a sudden it was like, oh, I get to be nobody and I get to know nothing. And that is so free in this moment. And that's what I heard, you know? And I'm like, oh my God. But I had, a, I mean, that would have, you know, 10 years ago, that would have been probably a week. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A week of lost time, right? Of just lost time. Of just like, oh God, you think about all the wasted time and energy. Energy. So at that moment, I had my presence back. Like I was present to this moment. The mind quieted. 
I could feel my breath. I came to sit, sat here and here and meditated. Mm-hmm. And I was back. But that's, you know, that that's the work. Mm. You're getting some some love in here. And I gotta I have to show you. Yes, Heather. Heather Dodd's a beautiful soprano, breath in, in the body. That's a lot. <laughs> and after and about that was Penny. Excuse me, Penny is over here enjoying the combo. She's sitting right over here. <laughs> quiet. Hey, Penny. <laughs> See, Penny, you got fans. She's sleeping. <laughs> She's g- getting in tune with her breath. And so, yes. <laughs> yes, Kevin. Hey, Kevin. Yes, you're hey, very Kevin. welcome. Yes, you're very welcome. Kenneth Gale, yeah, such an important conversation. Please share this, guys. As you know, I I normally ask. Yes. Hi, Ben. Just hearing the words about breath, about breathing. Yes. Makes absolutely makes you more aware. I know. Hey, Sue. Such an interesting conversation. Yeah, we have to have you come out to Portland and work and work with everybody, but young singers. I will bring my table. Anybody that wants me to bring my table once we're done with COVID. Exactly. Lower the breath and the body, and um, and we'll just break it apart and see where we are. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> okay, that's what we have to do. Yeah, is, that is the work. That is the work. Yeah, breath is life. It sure is, and we forget about that. Um, so I, we were we and we were talking a little bit before um about your studies, yeah. and and I, I I want I want you to share some of that with us because I think it's important you know, for people to, to hear and to, to hear some of these stories. I do think, um, I, th- I think the research is important because I, I think after COVID, it points us the direction where education, especially around the voice, can move. Um, you know, I often feel like those who enroll in a vocal program sort of buy into the dream and then they get to the end of it and and they they find that they bought into the, an empty dream. Mm-hmm. And I mean, we know the statistics of, you know, about 5%, 5 to 10% go on and actually have a career. And we do teach to that success model, mm-hmm. which to me, to me is a, a really representation of what our country is at the moment. And I feel that this movement of the matriarchy moving in, but to bring the education model into that as well, that you're actually teaching to the other 90%, that maybe it's a healing model rather than a success model. So that everyone that comes into a program knows they're going to leave with a voice. It may not be the idea of the voice that they had in in here, but they will understand what it means to be an entrepreneur, what it means to be in their body, what it means to be in the breath, what it means to use this voice in any way that their path opens for them. So I feel like that's where the area as a whole, um, from looking at the research needs to move. So some of the stories, I had to write some of this down because it's research and I, I need to get it right. Of course, understood. You know, it's, so I look at many things with self-confidence and looking at career potential, body image, all of this. And it found that there were three pillars to the voice, three solid pillars for someone to, to leave a program and feel like they have a voice. And it was a relationship with self, vulnerability, and self confidence. Mm-hmm. It was not vocal technique. It was, <laughs> it wasn't your aria package. It was those three simple things, and so that says that our young singers are craving relationship with self. They're craving. What is vulnerability and can I be confident? You know, when I looked at the career potential out of the study participants, so I did a one to 10 in measuring Mm -hmm. and eight or, and this was eight or above for career potential, only 58.5% 
of all the students at that conservatory believe they would have a career. 58.5% that check eight and above. Now you're, you're at a conservatory. I mean, and spending, <laughs> they're spending a lot of money. Lot of money. <laughs> so I did a pre and post study. So it was pre workshop and then post workshop. So just by creating a relationship with the breath and body, I work on stools, so our chairs, just to do somatic movements slowly, getting to know what is what is the foot, <laughs> what is what is your, what is your knee, what is your pelvic floor. I mean, really going into the function, the structure, but the emotion too, because that's what I was finding was everybody teaches function and structure, but no one teaches the whole human, which is this emotional aspect. So if we're not teaching all three of those principles, we're not teaching the whole singer. But after going out and doing table work, working with them individually to start to open up the body to where it was holding. Uh, a lot of times if I'm working with someone on the table, if they inhale and they expand, I may push in a little on the rib cage so they feel a little resistance and then I may move the hand the other way on on that um exhale or and i may reverse it depending on um what their how their body responds to that touch mm -hmm. so but after that it went from 58.5 percent to 86.2 percent wow that's a gigantic that's a huge leap it really tells you where the area is faulting because vocal instruction, and, and believe me, I've been in the voice teacher role. There's not enough time to do it all. No. Mm -mm. There's not enough time. And I really, my hat's off to every voice teacher because to, to assign repertoire, you know, to just have your own life and then try to get through the languages and the pitches. And I mean, there's not time. But if we had training to where we brought in somatic teachers or breath teachers or, or really explored movement. Like every university should have a movement class. Mm -hmm. Movement is one of the, I mean, the body is constantly in movement. Mm -hmm. So we don't have, I mean, conservatory, you get that, but in university, you don't always get movement. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the things. Mm -hmm. The other thing that was fascinating was that when we improve how we, our body like ability, Mm. The, voice, the voice goes along with it. If you do not like the body, the voice goes along with that. And so it was very, very much looking at this relationship with body as an influencer to the voice. Both are completely correlated. And you cannot separate. It also showed that you cannot separate the voice out of the breath and body relationship. Right. No, no, they're not, they're not together. they are together. <laughs> yeah. So that's some of the data. What's what's more, I you know I sat and listened to these human stories. You know I sat with them on you know on the I mean I sit with all my clients on the table, but we one of the study participants had the heart removed at nine months old, actually removed out of the body and then put back in the body. And this is in the data. Um, and I could feel when I put my hands on her that there was this feeling of, I'm gonna die. Sort of, mm -hmm. sort of like that feeling I had this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I, I went back in the incubator. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> no, it was great, it was great work. Um, so, so yes, yeah, she, um, I could really feel that the study participant was really, when it came to this area, that something traumatic would happen. Now we're talking about a singer that needs to expand that area, right? Mm -hmm. That these upper ribs need to be yes. movable. So trauma lives in the breathing body. So through a good bit of work, we got this area to open and tears started flowing and um, the study participant got off the 
table and said, or sat on the edge and said, I don't know who I am right now, but I know that I'm on a journey. And I know I want to get to know that person. Mm. Just that little bit of relationship. I mean, that's all, that's, that's all we all are looking for, I think, is, is these mirrors, these relationships. And what better relationship than have to have with our own body? Mm-hmm. So, you know, we have these wonderful hands, you know, we can, we can use them. We can feel what is happening in the mechanism. Mm-hmm. Um, and that participant said um, also, um, yeah, I'm on a journey. But I want to talk about one of participant number 29, where the participant says, I do not like my body. I sometimes have trouble looking at it. Participant number seven, I feel mostly overweight and despise my physical appearance. Number 26, love and hate relationship with the body. This, this, these are the young voices. But radical acceptance of that body in that moment would shift the paradigm on it. It's not about going and doing the diet, unless you feel that's an inner calling for you. Mm -hmm. But it's about, as a gay man, I have definitely had to really look, can I just accept, can I accept every cell of my being? Mm. Can I accept every cell, that every cell is loved? Mm. You know, that's what I had to really overcome. Oh. I mean, it's that's a radical. That's a that's a hard thing. That's a hard thing, uh, particularly in the time that we're in with social media and all of these things, and you know, all these ideals of what what is acceptable, what 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 is acceptable to be loved. Yeah, which oftentimes doesn't look like just everyday normal, you know people and like you said you know take if we take away you know sexuality and take away race and take away all of these all of these things you know we're all it's it's all one being one spirit we're all struggling with the same thing but but radical self love yes when you said that that really was a light bulb for me because i struggle all the time with, I mean, I love myself. I know I'm beautiful. I know that I'm smart and I'm gifted and I'm, I'm all of these wonderful things, but I have my own personal struggles with my body. You know what I mean? And it goes from being very, very young and to think that to love every cell, like every being, I'm like, ooh, like, it's always that thing of like, you struggle, you know that that's the right, you know that you have to lean into that, particularly as, a, as an, as a performer. When you are on the, you know, you you are there to embody every emotion and to step into another person's story. Yeah, you know, and that takes a, a confidence, that takes a a a, cor- a a courage, that takes a balls to do this. And and when you're struggling with that, it absolutely it comes out in your voice, in your body, and just the way you 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 um connect with other people. Absolutely, and it even goes to wigs and makeup. And this is where I'm like, every opera company listening, I want you to know that going beyond race, gender, and sexuality is so important because the trauma lives in the body. If that hair and makeup person does not know how to work on a black person, you have caused a locking in the breathing mechanism immediately and then that singer has to go back to their dressing room and try to get the nervous system to find a place of center to get the breath to be in center and let it go Mm -hmm. Mm. the data proves that not that specific example but we can look at the other and see it's it causes a locking in the breath that's where my future research actually I want to start to look at. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, in this time, it's interesting when we were doing the LA Opera panel, of course, and we were speaking about the the, the various uh, things that have happened to us in our careers, you know, centered around race and centered around, you know, 
in our, our, our uh, the things that have happened in the career. You know what I mean? The traumatic things that have happened. And to think about all the times something has happened and I had to walk away and be and get and find myself. I'm never thinking, okay, I need to get centered to, to but like I'm doing it and I'm thinking about it, but never in a deeper place. Like, cause it's my job. Like it's my job to get myself centered to go out there and sing, but never in a way of healing. It's just yeah. about going out and doing the job. It's never about healing myself, getting to a place that I can be in order to get out and do the job. It was just to do the job, get myself together to do the job. I froze. I froze. Yeah, okay. just getting myself together to do the job. Well, and and I know that as so many other singer stories, like that that is the that is, you know, I I look at the stories from the data and it it breaks my heart every time I look at the data. It breaks my heart. You know, and, but I think I also know that at the other end of the workshop, a lot of these things improved. You know the ease of breathing approves that was so the ease of breathing I, where is that one I don't need to find the dump the numbers but mm -hmm. showing that the nervous system came back to a state of calm that's the thing is we have to be in a state of calm for the body to fully vibrate mm -hmm. we have to be in a state of calm absolutely can you talk a little bit about um about sexuality and how that plays in because i want to give people tools and i want you know we're all struggling with different things we're all coming into this, this space with different stuff mm -hmm. but i don't think we even talk about that topic enough in our, for, in our you know what we do for me that was a hard place in the business um because i felt like there was like the gay boys and I never fit into the gay boy crowd. <laughs> like I, I never, like I just, I couldn't find, I just, that wasn't me. Um, I just happened and I identified more with he, she, them, you know? So I really was more in that identity um, now that I'm looking back. And, but I can't tell you how many times in my training I heard, you need to butch it up on stage. But every time, someone told me that it was saying, well, you're not good enough to be on stage as you are. So we need you to channel straight. Mm -hmm. And I don't think they understand how disembodying that is to a singer. You, you literally, I mean, I mean, I know, I know you, and I can see your face and I know you get that. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, that was my struggle and the struggle to be fully natural and fully me and fully movable and not a stiff straight man on a stage mm -hmm. tell it baby and there was it was you know that was part of mourning the singer that was part of my mourning was bringing in a healthy relationship with my sexuality, that every bit of it was okay. Every bit of it. Mm. He, he, them, if I wanna put on a skirt, I'll put on a skirt, walk around the house, you know, whatever I want, that should be okay. That should be okay. Absolutely, and you think that in the industry like this, it you would, think. you think, but it's, 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 it's actually quite different. And so because of the history, because of, you know, what the the roles and what we seeing in the structure of of the art form as it as it has been. Now I think things will change as you know new works are being produced as the younger generation, you know, they're very they they're very different, as you know, because you work with young yes. singers, you know, um what they will accept, what they won't accept, what um yeah, it's a different, it's a whole different thing. But uh, I think the, the the idea of of sexuality, of gender roles, of all these things needs needs to be you know pushed into the forefront as well as other as well as the other isms, you know, yeah. 
uh, that are that are there because if you have all of the isms, honey, <laughs> you can. <laughs> I mean, like oftentimes when we talk about you know um, uh, female uh, qu queer women, uh, you know of color, when yeah. you have all of the boxes, there's and, a lot. And, yeah, and and you don't or you don't identify with a specific. You are them, they. You know, like oh my God, you know, it's it's just like where's the where is the nourishment and the support and the kind of it structurally systematically. Yes. you know, for, 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 um, for all people. Yeah. And, and I always take it back to the body. I know what happens when you put an ism on people. I know what happens. Just it completely locks. Mm -hmm. And every rib needs to be able to move. Right. Every rib. That mm -hmm. inhale, all 24, even the floaters, <laughs> should, should be able to have that nice east and west expansion. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So talk a little bit about that, because I think that there are some non-singers on here. And also, you know, listen, that's the one thing I tell young singers when I work with them, like uh, either pre-college or uh you know, right in the beginning. If your teacher doesn't talk about breath, you have to leave the studio. Leave. Like that. It's yeah. non-negotiable, you know, and I actually didn't really learn about breath and, until I was like real hardcore into my 20s. Yeah. And I still, I mean, like, oh my God, I can't wait till COVID ends. I'm going to be like, Brad, I'm, I'm coming down. I'm coming down the work. But um, yeah, I didn't really, really learn, learn about that. So please, please talk a little bit about that for those non-singers. And I also want you to talk about how you feel about today's you know, artists and what you feel like need that we all need. Well, I think with COVID, I answered the letter plus letter um, question first. With COVID, I think we're all going to need to come back in. I think we are going to need. We're walking out with masks on. The breath is finding. The thing is, with this long of cycle of wearing mask, our breath, our breath is finding patterns. That's the one thing I know about working with the breath this long is it loves a pattern to stick to. You know, grab onto it. Um, because the consciousness starts to like that pattern. So we're going to have to undo a lot of patterns mm -hmm. of breathing that's been behind mask and also the, the social anxiety of actually being with people and, and touching people. <laughs> So there's this, all these components really go into the breath. Touch, huge. Um, you know, being able to to see someone's face, <laughs> it's huge with how the body opens and how it expands with energy. Um, so that is we're we're gonna as an area we're gonna have to really need some some help to guide. And I think that's why one of the reasons I wanted to come out with more of my research and start talking. You know, as, as far as the breathing mechanism, you know, I think the thing that I didn't really realize until I got into really studying what's actually happening is this beautiful, beautiful double glide that happens when the diaphragm is coming up and the actual, the ribs are actually moving back into their place. And that actually on the on a really long exhale, that diaphragm can actually come all the way up to the fourth rib. You know, that's high. Yeah, that's very high. <laughs> so, so you know, and that's those lower abdominals doing that work down there that we need. Mm -hmm. um, so that we can keep this expansion and this buoyancy happening. Um, but there's so much movement that's there. And what I see most often is that singers like to send the ribs out and they get stuck. Yeah, they they do they continue moving. They they're <laughs> so <laughs> hey, we all you should see me singing some of my Verdi artists. <laughs> Listen, I didn't want to shake my hand, and somebody's like, "Wait a minute, <laughs> so hard, right?" So I'm going to <laughs> so, But yeah, there's this you know there's there's a turning action of those ribs actually coming back in, in a downward motion. You know, it doesn't mean that we drop and collapse. There's still the padro, but there is this this movement, this gliding that is always happening in the in the breathing body. And I think often we 
we stop allowing it to move. Um, you know, those lower abdominals and pelvic floor are there so that this can be open. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And, and so it's knowing where the tension needs to be and where the release is, you know, so it's balancing, um, you know, all of that. You know, one of, you know, Angelique Clay. Oh, come so, on, of course. Dr. You know, Angel Dr. Angelique Clay. So she, I failed my first qualifying exams. I'm okay to admit that because it was it's what I needed. Um, but she said something that I think subconsciously sent me down the path of breath. She asked me what was one of the number one requirements for the breath. And she said, gravity. And I was like, gravity? <laughs> <laughs> and now that I have, I, gravity is one of our best friends. Mm -hmm. If we can just be in a relationship with gravity and let it all find its way and 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 the structure having its relationship with gravity. Mm -hmm. But you know, one of the biggest things I work with with people on the table is gravity. Because as they're laying down, I can move gravity with my hands, their relationship with gravity. So um oh, I have I have to go to the comments. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Hey, Liz, who is a fantastic voice teacher. So excited to hear and someone Liz. talking about that. And a fantastic soprano. I mean, yeah. of the dramatic. Uh, yes. yes. We like the dramatics. We do. Alexa, Dr. Clay. Yes, we love Dr. Clay. Yeah. Buoyancy. Heather. Mm -hmm. Yes. You're taught that by so many teachers to stuck ribs. Yeah. Or not at all, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Michelle, thank you for talking about breath and healing and this radical. So, you know, even even when we um, even when you say things like breath and healing, everyone thinks, oh, God, you know, here we go. With all of these, here we go. Here we go. with all this BS, this flowery kind of like, you know, and then if you tell them you stop eating meat, Lord have mercy. It's like. <laughs> They're like, oh God, you know. I want you to talk about that a little bit. How that changed your 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 um your life when you changed yeah. what you put in your body. I working with the breath in this way. So first of all, we do. So we need a balance of heart and mind. <laughs> so so that's really when it comes to how that we can say it's woo woo to talk about healing, but we need a balance of heart and mind, which is why we talk about function and structure. But most people that I have spoke with about these particular things, the heart is something where the, it hits that vulnerability. And so how do we open the heart as singers? How do we open our heart as humans? Mm -hmm. You know, so that has been I think more my journey over the past five years of what is what's living in the the heart and and not the physical heart but for me it's the spiritual heart you know what are the qualities because when i look at the breath see this is how i view the breath breath is oneness because my breath is also your breath there's no duality in that mm. We introduce a body. My body is different from your body. So we have duality. So I want to learn the qualities of the breath because it is pulling in the qualities of oneness for me. Yes. And so for me, when I go into that inner space, my qualities, since I've done a lot of this healing work, is gentleness. It's compassion. It's trying to speak from a deeper place of wisdom rather than what I read in a book. Mm. Um, it's trying to care for myself when I'm in those places of the shadow. It's allowing myself to have every emotion, that I'm safe to have every emotion. And at this point, it even goes even further. Can I can I feel that all of that, even the outer world, 
and I start to feel that that tree outside of my office, that it also lives in here. Mm. And when I close my eyes, I still see the tree. So why is it any different? Just because my eyes are open. Right. I think you have that as a child and then you lose it. So my journey has been to get back to that six-year-old boy. And that's what the voice gave me. So, you know, students often ask, do you miss singing? I'm like, the voice gave me back that six-year-old boy. Why would I miss singing? Mm. That was the whole point of the voice degree, of the path, mm. was to give me back that joy. So I experienced that when I'm working with people. I see that little boy and girl in all of them. And I'm just trying to remind them that they're safe enough to open back up to that. Mm. And then the voice comes along and says, oh, that's how it works. Mm-hmm. Mm. I apologize. No, it's good. I love silence. Uh, my favorite, one of my favorite things, Karen, is silence. To just sit with the silence and to go into it and to be with it. And there's such richness and depth in that place. And it's hard for me to go to the outer world. You know, it wasn't until your call this morning because I had been, I was in that place. And that is such a tender place. It's so tender. You know, and then what would it be like to sing from that place? Yeah, sometimes you get it very few, those special times. Very few. Very very few. few. Mm -hmm. We're shedding these, we're, we're trying to get all the, the layers away, the, the, the impressions. We're trying to clear the impressions. Mm -hmm. So what I, for me, what I'm always watching now is what's the quality of the impression coming to me? Mm -hmm. So I, I am on a vegetarian diet, you know, because it's about the impression, you know, it's, and I, I don't interact with a lot of people. I keep it very small because it's about minimizing the impressions. Mm -hmm. of the heaviness because I'm just trying to stay in the quality the qualities that the breath is teaching me mm. and my husband's a psychotherapist that also works with the breath he's a magnificent breath worker so we just this is what we do this is our life it's <laughs> uh and what a beautiful life what a service what a what a um what a gift what a gift Okay. I think I needed this more than anybody. <laughs> anybody. We have some um, questions. Oh, um, and if you have questions, please throw them in the chat, please. Um, tips for singers with scoliosis. Yes. Rocking. Sort of side to side as much as you can, laying down. You know, if you be careful rocking side to side. If you if you do more rocking front and back on the floor, it will sort of, but be gentle. So, um, rocking, just try that to see. And also reach out to me, you know. And yes. More. Dave, reach out, reach out to Brad, please. And, uh, and connect with him. There was a, is it? Oh, oh, he was saying that his breath feels like it's cut in half when he hasn't had an adjustment, a recent, okay. Yeah. Some of the rocking actually gets some of those places to start to, to move, because we have all these articulators along the spine. There's 100 articulators in the thoracic cavity. So when those articulators get stuck, 
is the issue that we have. That's why rocking side to side tends to help if you're, again, on the floor with gravity. So you're just trying to get those articulators to move as gentle as possible with scoliosis. So. Mm. Wow, the longest journey is from, yes, from the head to the heart. Yeah. Yes, Jim. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. Uh, Heather, can you recommend daily exercises with the breath to release the ribs? I can, you know, just working. So for me, it really, it really is about spending some time just to remind them the direction that they're going. <laughs> so, so just sort of as I exhale, having this sort of downward and then coming across. Because if you look at the, the muscles that come across the ribs, they actually go diagonal. This must, the, the ribs go this way, but this goes this way. And so I'm, I'm often rubbing the direction of the muscle, of the, um, those intercostals that are, are layered across. So even just that action, I love to work with numbers, um, sometimes one to 10, just repeating, but uh, on the exhale, just to see uh, where you are in that and try just to have some flexibility as you're just working with that. So that's just a few little things. That's with, you can do that in um, just speech, but in singing, just you having your own hands on your own body is like the most important thing. So you can feel what is actually happening. Are they stuck? Can I remind them just to continue? <laughs> you know, um, with women, um, especially heavy breasted women, the second rib, there is a joint in the sternum. Mm -hmm. You can feel it sort of there. It actually is a joint. It sometimes gets locked. Mm -hmm. So if you just tap on it while you're singing, mm -hmm. you can even tap on it. You can start to feel the breath come right in. Mm -hmm. So just those, that even that little bit helps free those upper ribs because where most people get locked are in the upper ribs mm -hmm. right? or either they're pushing the lower ribs out. So. Exactly. But, I always yeah. get locked back here in my, because also when you're heavy breasted, you know, everything yeah. like that as well. And so, mm -hmm. so for me working with imagery, feeling the, the um, clavicular area, thinking of it sort of as a nice curtain rod. Mm -hmm. Bending. Yeah, absolutely. And then the shoulder blades are actually the curtains that hang all the way to the floor. <laughs> but you know, the old school thing is used to, I mean, they would, they, they, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were like these mad, but to take it, but the taking up the space as well. Yeah. So let's talk. So some of the first work I do with people talking about the breath is, is learning that we have an outer breath and we have an inner breath. You know, and then I look at the breath in three layers, you know, upper, middle, and lower. So we're really looking at those five parts, the outer and the inner. And and what I was so excited about COVID was that COVID gave us this awareness that there's actually six feet always around us in the breath. So I was like, oh, good. Everybody has the awareness now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes, of the space. Yes, yes. In, in singing, it's even, you know, we know it's even further. Yes. So when I go into a space and I'm trying to hold the space, it is literally about bringing that bubble because we can feel where that safety bubble is. Mm -hmm. If you have someone walk towards you, you'll tell them where to stop. Right. You'll find out where your safety bubble is, which is really where how far the breath is starting to go out. Mm -hmm. But with singing, the job is to take that bubble and act for me and actually move it actually around the whole audience. That the whole audience is part of your breathing space. Mm. And, and you can even take it to outside the house, outside the opera house, that I actually hold the whole opera house in my breathing space and have this nice peripheral vision of being that big, that I'm that safe to be that big. Mm-hmm. And then let let what what it does let it do what it does. Yeah, know? let it do it right, exactly. But, but keep like, but keep that. Keep that. Yeah, just. Mm -hmm. I mean. Yeah, and Heather, Heather's a teacher. Please reach out to Brad to Brad Heather. 
So you guys can discuss what that means. And, you know, this is, and also, you know, before I go to William's question, you can uh, look at that. Um, when, when we come out of COVID, and you, you've been all been singing in these, these, you know, in your apartment, you know, so many singers have been singing in their apartment and these virtual offerings and singing in microphones or students, the poor students, you know, yeah. have been singing it in their parents' house or whatever the case may be. We're going to have to rework everything. We are. We, we literally are. Mm -hmm. I, I think we have no idea what we're going to have to do, but I, based off of what I've seen before COVID, that's everybody's going to be like, Hey, how you doing? <laughs> right. <laughs> what I'm not singing in my bedroom. <laughs> how, how do I, how do I open back up? Uh -huh. How do I become expansive? How do I, you know, the, hopefully the muscle memory will kick in, but the young singers are the ones that I'm, you know, yeah. Really worried about. Yeah, it's not the ones that have been, that know what it's like to be expansive and fill a gigantic space on a big long phrase. And the people that have been doing that for a while, you know, you just got to dust it off and kind of get it back into shape. You know, it's it's the kids who've never who've never experienced or, or maybe they they started to feel it and then COVID happened and you know yeah. we're it's a year in and so yeah it's it's gonna be um, and uh, you know. I, I don't believe these small, I, I hate the practice room situations. I, I, I the whole, the whole, everyone knows now I hate this. I, I don't, I hate it here. It's just ridiculous, you know, but William, well, let's get to his question. What opera singers do you enjoy listening to who demonstrate the use of breath in a manner you are informing us about? <laughs> That's a loaded question. <laughs> it is a loaded question. It's trying to get me in trouble. Mm -hmm. no. Call me and DM me, right? <laughs> On that one. William, you know better than to ask that yeah. question mm -hmm. <laughs> on this on this platform. Okay. <laughs> now we do tea, we we do shoot the tea, you know, <laughs> but no, ma'am, no, sir. No, we're not. <laughs> Six feet of space for breath. Yes. <laughs> uh anyway, I have cried. We have laughed. We have done the thing. Please tell if if anybody else has questions. Please put them in the chat, but but Brad, I want you to I I thank you. Oh, I I, I love you, and um, you know I love all of my ASC brothers and sisters. So um, yes. Is there anything else you want to share with us to bless us in this in this space in this moment in this beautiful? And please, if you've not shared this um this live yet, uh, either before or after, please share. I mean. My God, you know, everyone comes out for the big stars and the this is and the that's and you know, and, and everyone is so different. And yeah. but please, I think this is so many, so much, so many, uh, so much blessing, so many blessings in mm -hmm. this in in this conversation. Um, yeah, please, please, please give us some more, Brad. <laughs> you know, safety is the most important. Safety in relationship for me is the most important thing for a singer safety and relationship and that's why we are at such a an important time in the world and also in our area because we every singer has to be safe and we have worked from a place where every singer was not safe they didn't feel safe mm -hmm. and it wasn't responsible you know i think well you know, I think the breath teaches, like I said, the breath teaches us the qualities. And the qualities are not in in the materialistic world that we need right now. The qualities that we need are so much deeper than that. Um, but get to know your bodies. Love them radically. Accept them for where they are today. Like, like just love every cell like and when you breathe in feel it like feel, take the moment to feel it just come across the palate and i mean just there's i mean for me there's nothing better than just feeling that feeling the expansion mm. and when we're singing to to be able to do that too just to feel it that i can actually have that i actually have permission to feel all of myself when I sing. Mm. You know, I was, I had this 
lesson come to me when I was with one of my healing el elders. And the message was, Brad, I want you to feel yourself all the way to the edge of your skin. Every bit of it. Because every bit of that needs to feel safe and open and malleable. Every bit of it. You deserve to have every bit of that feeling. Mm -hmm. mm. And so I'm always like, how do I, can I feel myself all the way to here? And then I bring myself into that outer breath. Oh, can I feel myself out here too? Mm -hmm. Wow, I don't, I'm, I'm not just this body. Right. I'm not this body. Mm -hmm. I'm not this body. I am something much. So that that's what I have to say is go beyond gender, race, and sexuality. Go beyond that. Yes. Way beyond it. Mm. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. I love you. And I love my combos crew. Thank you all for coming in. Brad, tell people how they can um, uh, contact you. And I'll put your website. I put your website on the announcement, but I'll throw it in because um, it goes up on YouTube. It stays up on YouTube yeah. and Facebook. So, so um, I need, I'm, I'm building out Dr. Bradley Williard. So that will be there um, at some point. But just find me on the Insta. Dr. Bradley Williard on the Insta, also on Facebook. Um, I like the Insta a little. Yeah. It, it's easy. It's um, easy. And you can always go to weirdmethod.com and write me an email if you want to write a longer email. Um, that's just really the research there. So, so yeah, so find me. Find me on the social. On the social. That's the way. That's the yeah. way. Yeah. Thank, yes. Thank you all again. Um, reach out to Brad. Connect with him. Most of our, everybody's on Insta. It should be. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you all. Let's see. Next week, I'm going to be in Minnesota uh, recording for Minnesota Opera's Virtual Gala. And um, I think I'm doing the combos there. I don't know. I'm, I got to figure it out. But anyway, I'm, I'll probably see you all next week. Um, uh, and uh, anyway, again, thank you, Brad. You have to come back. I invite everybody to come back. Um, right. That I feel maybe we could do part two and you know do some interesting things. And anyway, I love you all. Thanks for coming again. Have a great night, Brad. Don't don't check the log off yet. Okay. Uh, uh, yes. Thank you, Martin. I said my my firm from Scotland. Uh, anyway, have a great night, you guys. And remember, share this with your friends on your pages and all your socials. Okay. Talk to you soon. Bye. Guys. Bye.